This is part two of Joseph Smith Has Spoken. Part two, The House of Jacob. If you have not seen part one, please see part one before you look at this video. This is a follow-up to some of those topics discussed. Essential scriptures for latter days. We'll start with Matthew 7. 14 and 13, enter ye in the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate. And narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. This is a common scripture, many have heard it many times. We're going to find similar scriptures and compile them and set the tone for this lesson. Isaiah 28, verse 8 and 9, For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness, so that there is no place clean. Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. If we read and understand the prophecies in scriptures such as the book of Revelation, we may soon come to believe that the coming of the Son of Man is near. Yet, the conditions for this big event are described in the book of Matthew as follows, but, and this is Matthew 24, 37-39. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Verse 38, For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came, and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. This sets the stage for the early church, the restored gospel through Joseph Smith, Question, what were considered the most essential and true points of the gospel when the Latter-day Saints Church was organized? If we revisit the mindset taught to the early saints from the earliest times of the church emergence two centuries ago, we can gain some insight on this question. Earliest and most basic tenets of the early church are described in Doctrine and, Covenant, Doctrine and Covenants 10, verse 60, quote, And I will show unto this people that I had other sheep, and that they were a branch of the house of Jacob. On a visit to the Huntington family, this is an account from O.B. Huntington called Prophecy Held in Abeyance. We're going to give more details on that prophecy today. Father Joseph Smith Sr. visited the family and described to them the plans to move out west to the Rocky Mountains. Quote, the Lord has told Joseph that when we leave here, we will go into the Rocky Mountains, right into the midst of the Lamanites. This information filled our hearts with unspeakable joy, for we knew that the Book of Mormon and this gospel had been brought to light more for the remnants of Jacob on this continent than for the Gentiles. Father Smith again enjoined upon us profound secrecy in this matter, and I don't think it was ever uttered by one of Father Huntington's family. When the saints were driven from the state of Missouri, it was a very surprising circumstance that we could not understand. After having been called there by the word of God, that we, then, must leave the country. We had been instructed that in Missouri was the most hallowed spot on earth the very land where the new Jerusalem will be built. Now, when compelled to hunt for another country, we naturally asked ourselves the question, where can we go? Where can we find another holy land? How or when shall we get back to the consecrated spot for the new Jerusalem that is to be built? No other land would answer for that one object, according to our understanding, and so it really is. But there will be only a few of us left to help another people build a new Jerusalem. According to the Book of Mormon, 31st chapter, 
and 22nd through the 25th verses. We live in perilous times. This, uh, this verse and chapter helps us understand the millions of souls of the house of Jacob that are at stake. Verse 22, But if they, the house of Jacob, will repent and hearken unto my words, and harden not their hearts, I will establish my church among them, and they shall come in unto the covenant, and be numbered among this the remnant of Jacob unto whom I have given this land for their inheritance. So who is the remnant of Jacob? That is the inhabitants of the Americas before the Europeans came. Now we, we have uh, the term Lamanites, but very often in the scriptures we call them the remnant of Jacob or the house of Jacob. And they shall assist my people. Now who's going to assist who? Well, if the Gentiles repent, they can assist the remnant of Jacob, and also as many of the house of Israel as shall come, that they may build a city which shall be called the New Jerusalem. So who are the principal players in building that New Jerusalem? According to Joseph Smith and the scriptures and his revelations and early church teachings, of course, the remnant of Jacob are the original Americans on this continent. Verse 24, And then shall they assist my people, that they may be gathered in, who are scattered upon all the face of the land, in unto the new Jerusalem. And then shall the power of heaven come down among them, and I also will be in the midst. A quote by Joseph Smith, The entire land of North and South America was the Zion of the Lord. This is a consistent teaching in the early church while Joseph Smith was alive. It was never changed by Joseph Smith. It was never contradicted. It was consistent. If we look at the early history books, pre-21st century, of course, this is actually even the mid-20th century, these were common understandings based on the research. Here's a, a picture of pre-Columbian trade routes. Some quotes from that this book. Uh, it is difficult to understand how any intelligent person could ever have doubted that there was a wide exchange of ideas and goods among the nations of America. That's from a book called Columbus Came Late by Mason, page 57. Another book, Ancient America by Jones, page 17, The Builder's Civilization. It has been sufficiently shown that this people are of the great Hebrew family. Referring to all of the, the people, the nations, on the the North and South American continents before Europe came. So there's no doubt that there was a lot of interaction and travel between them. There was pre-Columbian trade routes. This was documented very well in the history. We have kind of seen this his history become obscured since then, which is a whole different discussion. And what did Joseph Smith say? Well, I mean, we have the Book of Mormon title page. This is also from the first presentation. Wherefore, it is an abridgment of the record of the people of Nephi and also of the Lamanites, written to the Lamanites, who are a remnant of the house of Israel. What's the point of the Book of Mormon? As you have heard in my first presentation and now this one, there's an emphasis on the remnant of Jacob, referred to as the Lamanites. This is written to the Lamanites, also to the Jews and the Gentiles. Those are the three. That's how it classifies the entire world. You're either one of those three, well, of course, that's all your only choice. So which one are you? 
This is written by way of commandment and also by the spirit of prophecy and of revelation. These are not arbitrary words. This is an actual revelation, this page. Written and sealed up and hid up unto the Lord, that they might not be destroyed, to come forth by the gift and power of God unto the interpretation thereof, sealed by the hand of Moroni, and hid up unto the Lord, to come forth in due time by way of the Gentiles, the interpretation thereof by the gift of God. The Book of Mormon, 3rd Nephi, 21st chapter, 22 to 25. Of course, uh, we're looking at, um, in the previous two slides, we, we read those verses, some, some comments about this. The devil is the one who wants the people denied of their choice blessings. For some reason, two centuries later, this, this prophecy is slow to take form. And what does the devil want? Well, that's what he wants. The evil one wants anyone who chooses to serve God discredited and their reputation permanently marred beyond recognition. This is so that they will not be recognized and given credence when they bring the message of the gospel. If you have a message, a true message, and you're a simple messenger, you've all heard the saying, kill the messenger, discredit the messenger, that will discredit the message. We see it many times in the society today. A lot of people are noticing the media will attack those truths they do not like, that are sensitive, that make them feel uncomfortable. There are questions with obvious answers whether the scriptures quoted so far align with what most people know and understand about Joseph Smith. Or what most members of even the Latter-day Saint Church know and understand about Joseph Smith. As pointed out in the previous video, much of the original beliefs and understanding of the restored gospel has since been lost as it pertains to the true points of this gospel Joseph Smith helped bring to our attention. With a continued underwhelming presence from the priesthood of this current church in modern times. We're still waiting for an awakening to take place in the church. So these words that you are hearing and reading today on this video will be fulfilled. So if you possess a heritage, this is a request and an urging to you. If you possess a heritage, heritage that goes back to the original church times, for example, you cannot afford to be neglectful in the study of your ancestors who knew and were loyal to Joseph Smith to try to understand better what they knew and lived and died for and to make it possible to allow this gospel to move forward. Those early saints were unfalteringly loyal to Joseph Smith and the true points of the gospel and on many occasions proved they would pay any price even given their lives, absolutely any price, their possessions, their houses, they would give any price to serve the Lord and be loyal to the will of the Lord. We're going to talk a little bit in this part of the presentation about the offering from the sons of Levi. Behold, the great day of the Lord is at hand, and he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Let us, therefore, as a church and a people, and as Latter-day Saints, offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. And let us present in this holy temple, when it is finished, a book containing the records of our dead, which shall be worthy of all acceptation. Doctrine and Covenants, section 128, verse 24, continuing, And the sons of Moses and of Aaron shall be filled with the glory of the Lord upon Mount Zion in the Lord's house, whose sons are ye, and also many whom I have called and sent forth to build up my church. For there 
For whoso is faithful unto the obtaining of these two priesthoods, of which I have spoken, and the magnifying their calling, are sanctified by the Spirit, unto the renewing of their bodies. They become the sons of Moses and of Aaron, and the seed of Abraham, and the church, and kingdom, and the elect of God. Doctrine and Covenants, verses 32, 34 of section 84. So who will they be who honor, who step up to, and as this scripture says, magnify their priesthood calling? We are not seeing this prophecy of whoso is faithful fulfilled at this time, two centuries later, after Joseph Smith put the wheels in motion for this great work to take place. Millions of people yet await, millions of souls. In Doctrine and Covenants, section 109, verses 54 to 61, here's part of that prayer for the Lord's mercy. We are talking about Joseph Smith's revelation and referring the commandments which thou have given unto us who are identified with the Gentiles. All right. That's a key point of this entire scripture. We're talking about the house of Jacob, the children of Jacob, and we who are identified with the Gentiles. That's everyone else that's not Israelite, Lamanite, Jews. Quote, Have mercy, O Lord, upon the nations of the earth. Have mercy upon the rulers of our land. May those principles, which were so honorably and nobly defended, Namely, the constitution of our land by our fathers be established forever. Notice the loyalty and reverence for the constitution that the early church leaders had, even though their constitutional rights were not respected and not protected. The church has always loved the constitution as a divinely inspired document. It's, it's very important to distinguish between the system of government, the constitution which guides the land and the government and is supposed to be honored and separate that from actual wicked men who have gotten into power and committed atrocities. This is one distinguishing characteristic of the church that even though there are atrocities and horrific crimes committed, even by governmental leaders, the Constitution has always been a sacred and blessed document. Verse 55. Remember the kings, the princes, the princes, the nobles, and the great ones of the earth, and all people and all churches, and the poor, all the poor, the needy, and afflicted ones of the earth, that their hearts may be softened when thy servants shall go out of from thy house, O Jehovah, to bear the testimony of thy name, that their prejudices may give way before the truth, and thy people may obtain favor in the sight of all, that all the ends of the earth may know that we, thy servants, have heard thy voice, and that thou hast sent us, that from among all these thy servants, the sons of Jacob, may gather out the righteous to build a holy city to thy name, as thou hast commanded them. Now these words, O Lord, we have spoken before thee concerning the revelations and commandments which thou hast given unto us, who are identified with the Gentiles. But thou knowest, thou hast a great love for the children of Jacob, who have been scattered upon the mountains for a long time in a cloudy and dark day. We therefore ask thee to have mercy upon the children of Jacob, that Jerusalem from this hour may begin to be redeemed. Has this church remained true to this calling? Why or why not? Have you ever pondered the peculiar nature of the wording of the official church name restored through Joseph Smith, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? Doesn't the term Latter-day Saints indicate some feeling of a lack of permanence 
just the name of a church that which exists for a specific and limited time only and of course even for a specific purpose this church is set up to bring the message to the children of Jacob primarily as you heard earlier the family of Obi Huntington mentioned they realized that the primary people were the house of Jacob and others that will help build the new Jerusalem are helpers in that role they are not the primary they are not the primary actors the Gentiles of the church it is the house of Jacob that will be the primary people that build up the new Jerusalem in Joseph Smith's account John had told Joseph Smith and Oliver Calvary in May of 1829 that this priesthood quote shall never be taken again from the earth until the sons of Levi do offer again an offering unto the Lord in righteousness so this is uh, interesting wording of course Joseph Smith did have something a little bit more specific but we ask if if this is this concept um, this offering uh, what what are in the people's hearts what's in the people's hearts what's in the heart of many of the priesthood holders today behold I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers lest I come and smite the earth with a curse now as children of the fathers talking about your ancestors many many people in the church today do have pioneer roots um, and there is still an appreciation for the sacrifices that helped establish the church how many people still have that great fondness and loyalty to their heritage and their ancestors and are you honoring that Joseph Smith said I might have rendered a plainer translation to this from Malachi chapter 4 verse 5 and 6 but it is sufficiently plain to suit my purposes as it stands so there could have been a more put into this verse but what Joseph Smith says it is sufficient to know in this case that the earth will be smitten with a curse that's the main point unless there is a welding clink of a link of some kind or another between the fathers and the children I apologize for the typo there upon some subject or other and behold what is that subject it is the baptism for the dead for we without them cannot be made perfect neither can they without us be made perfect neither can they nor we be made perfect without those who have died in the gospel also with many generations passing since the time of Joseph Smith this becomes a bigger work than ever With this in mind, question, do you know who Joseph Smith is? What did he establish this church to do? I'm going to go back to that quote from the Huntingtons, the visit of Joseph Smith Sr. to the Huntington family, because this illustrates what the, the people of that time understood about the Book of Mormon. And why did the gospel it brought to light quote this information filled our hearts with unspeakable joy for we knew that the Book of Mormon and this gospel had been brought to light more for the remnants of Jacob on this continent than for the Gentiles so you're either one or the other you're either an original American on this continent or in as the doctrine and covenants 109 mentioned you're classified with the gentiles that's everyone else that did not have ancestors going back many centuries father smith again enjoined upon us the profound secrecy at that time on this matter it's moving ahead uh, verse 48 of doctrine and covenants section 10 yay 
And this was their faith, that my gospel, which I gave unto them, that they might preach in their days, might come unto their brethren, the Lamanites. This is all through the Doctrine and Covenants, this message. So we talk about how sometimes these theories come along later. They forget that there is a history in this country at one point where it was openly talked about that, that there was a heritage and uh, the people had strong indications that they were Hebrew or of Hebrew descent. This goes back even when Joseph Smith was alive. Many noted, many noted men of that time, so even Webster, who is for whom Webster's dictionary is named, had mentioned that it appears we have a Hebrew connection on this continent and South America. And of course, there was a wide of exchange, a wide exchange of ideas and goods among the ancient nations of America, both South America, North America. There's a book, Columbus Came Late, and on page 57, this is by Mason, it says, it is difficult to understand how any intelligent person ever could have doubted that there was a wide exchange of ideas and goods among the ancient nations of America. A wise man told my father once, an honest day's pay for an honest day's work. We're talking about getting this message out. Another favorite saying is, time nor tide wait for no man. If you're waiting for a time to help preach this message and no one's tapped you on this shoulder, you, you need to revisit your reasons why you are a member of the church or why do you believe this gospel if, do you actively try to help the church fulfill its mission it's difficult to understand how any intelligent person ever could have doubted that there was a wide exchange of ideas and goods among the ancient nations of America because they were basically the one people there is multiple ways, evidence, there's pictures, many ruins in both continents that show it was a very similar culture in, in all areas of the continent. And so why do people shirk from their duties to help spread this message of the gospel? The primary reasons for the Book of Mormon to come forth at this time well, a lot of people are hearing of so-called science, which allegedly discredits the Book of Mormon. We're going to talk about that in this presentation. And, of course, there's the test that Joseph Smith had, and there's a, a video that's very well done that I'm recommending to answer this second question. It was similar to a test where Abraham took his son Isaac up the hill and and that was to prove his love for God. He wasn't allowed to carry out that command when he proved himself loyal to God above everyone else. It's similar to this story of Heber and Valet Kimball, the greatest test of faith. I will put a link in the video description. And that pertains to how Joseph Smith taught the law of celestial mar marriage. So please watch the following video. You will understand more. The late had a vision where this was taught to her without anyone explaining it to her. The beautiful story. It's a these are men are beautiful in their intent and they're pure in their intent to serve the Lord. And there's there would naturally be a desire if you actually knew who Joseph Smith was and his standing before and after his life and his continued authority to hold the keys, you might want some connection in your descendants to Joseph Smith. So to understand the magnitude of this story through the eyes of a saintly woman such as the late Kimball is to gain a glimpse into what the magnitude of the being Joseph Smith was. And these men had pure motives 
They did not want to be hated and persecuted and killed as Joseph Smith was. This was unlike the wicked natures projected at them from the wicked. A wicked person tries to understand Joseph Smith and they project wicked motives because that's what's in their own minds. They become accusers and even in that case they became murderers. Um, people in who are actually citizens of Nauvoo apostatized. The second area I went over, but let's talk about the first, the keys to understanding. The clever manipulation of scientific studies. A lot of people are intimidated when someone will throw elaborate scientific words at them. They don't know how to respond. They're told, go read this book, you'll understand how the Mormon church cannot possibly be true. The books are very complicated. It requires a comprehension of many books at the same time, tying all of this together, if in fact these theories disprove the Mormon religion. All you have to do is recite the talking points and your typical member of the church will shirk and back down because they don't have an answer. They, they don't have a full understanding of the science of the time used to attack the church. But we're going to look at that science a little closer in this presentation. These critics of the church often pose as knowledgeable members of the scientific community, often attacking Latter-day Saints, and they utilize many multi-pronged attack techniques. One common ploy is to, is to recite or cite elaborate racial classification vocabulary words, which I'm going to mention here coming up. Yet, they often do not come across as being able to speak in any kind of language of scientific inquiry or in the alignment of the theories they claim in their assertions. This is where you need to ask the questions. When someone's throwing scientific terms at you, you need to question them as I'm going to show you now. And typically, these anti-Mormon scientists, <laughs> for lack of a better description, they if you ask them questions, you'll find they have not thought through the connections of the science they claim discredits the Book of Mormon. One study that I'm going to mention, it's, it's by a very noted biologist. It'll help bring understanding to some of the pseudo uh, science of this time and the fallacy of connecting fragments of various studies to discredit the gospel. That study is by Ernst Mayer and it was in 1982. Anyone familiar with Mayer's work will know it has often been cited by those who today try to connect the theories and histories and origins of various theories to create a new theory from the various fragments of study conclusions. The growth of biological thought, diversity, evolution, and inheritance by Harvard University Press. Again, it's Ernst Mayer. It's a good study to look at because if you understand basic points made by the study, you will understand that it applies to much of the research in general that deals with the investigation of life. Those who attempt to cite science to discredit what they refer to as the Mormon religion are actually just piecing together various fragments of unverified facts, theories, you might connect a, a fact here and there, but in their entirety, when you, when you go over a course of hundreds of years, we're going to see some of the results of what that attempt will produce. And so they have various fragments of unverified theories, facts, and they'll attack and supplant one religion and try to replace it with their own disjointed religious beliefs under the guise of science. There is a key, and there are keys to understanding the clever manipulation of scientific studies. We're going to point out here some reasons why there is so much contradiction among the scientific community. When confronted by one of these so-called scientific critics, you need to understand that when they are simply telling someone to go read someone's book or study, 
or a collection of books and or studies, this is unacceptable. That does not prove anything. That does not prove that this it does not prove the Mormon religion is wrong. It does not discredit it. You're just throwing a, a bunch of things against the wall, so to speak, and relying on the catching your your victim off guard. That victim being the unsuspecting church member who has a testimony, but all of a sudden has to come face to face that there's studies out there they're not aware of. And they, t they prey on your ignorance that way. By what you do not know, they tell you what you believe is false. So if you understand what they're doing, you would know it is unacceptable because of the numerous problems with those works. This study by Mayer serves as a model to point out some reasons why there's so much contradiction among the scientific community when it comes to attempts to disprove the Mormon religion, as they call it, they typically present names we presumably have no standing to question. We are expected to accept that they are infallible in their mid-20th century's expertise. They will insist that their attacks require the listener to just simply accept them on blind faith alone. Don't you realize that this study has disproved your church? And you'll say no. If you ask them questions, they'll say, you need to read the study. Well, what, what you need to find out is if they have read the study, because there's a good chance they haven't read the study they're using against you. They have not, they have not reconciled that study with contradicting theories that other scientists have produced that may stand alone, but they do, do not ever combine. They might employ extensive skills of scientific terms, and they'll expect that we're going to be accepting at face value the seamless meshing of the scientific positions. Bear in mind the injunction from Ernst Mayer. The farther back we go in time, the less important becomes the store of scientific knowledge. The store of scientific knowledge of the period. And the more important, the general intellectual atmosphere. And we are hinting here, uh, of course, that that's a common thing that DNA research does, the so-called DNA research. They go back in time, but they do not, they do not observe the injunction from Ernst Mayer. The less important becomes the store of scientific knowledge, the farther back you go. Much of modern biology, particularly the various controversies between different schools of thought, cannot be fully understood without a knowledge of the historical background of the problems. See, there's just too much data that's missing to say we've traced a DNA 2,000 years ago to this region, and you don't have a comprehensive history of the migration patterns and anyone that's interacted with that people. Okay, that is uh, that's science that doesn't have much value when they attempt that. If if they allow themselves to be subjected to the microscope as they want to do to your beliefs, you'll find that their argument falls apart. He will go on to state, by necessity, the writing of history is subjective and ephemeral. Histories like science itself are constantly in need of revision erroneous interpretations of an earlier author eventually become myths accepted without question and carried forward from generation to generation. See that's how that's how the science works that discredits the gospel. Science is made by people and the impact of individual scientists like Newton, Darwin, and Mendel has often been of quasi revolutionary nature. However, this approach shares with the purely chronological approach one very serious weakness. It atomizes each major scientific problem. You cannot be combining works of Newton, Mendel, Darwin, of course. The species problem, for example, 
will have to be discussed under Plato, Aristotle, Cecilpino, and the herbalists, Buffon, Linnaeus, Cuvier, Darwin, Weisman, Nageli, De Vries, Jordan, Morgan, Huxley, Mayer, Simpson, and so on. When we compare published histories of science, it becomes at once apparent that different historians have quite different concepts of science and also of history writing. Ultimately, all of them attempt to portray the increase in scientific knowledge and the changes in interpretive concepts. concepts. Not all historians of science have attempted to answer the six principal questions that must be addressed by anyone who wants to describe the progress of science critically and comprehensively. Who, when, where, what, how, and why. That's, it. that's, that's very important. Um, you'll, you'll rarely see that. There's rarely a study that uh, at least hasn't talked about that. Uh, there's a lot of studies, but if, if they truly answer those questions, it would, it would be a study bigger than multiple fold books in thickness. If the critic cited citations of the racial classification terms, for example, such as Mediterranean Caucasoids, that's a, that's a favorite for some who are trying to tell church members that, hey, the DNA from that area in the Mediterranean does not match what you're saying, which without knowing the history, it's actually an impossible endeavor to, to pinpoint those kinds of things. That ploy of the use of elaborate uh, racial classifications comes from a bygone era where terms like that are obsolete. Race acquired its modern meaning in the field of physical anthropology through scientific racism starting in the 19th century. This is from an article in, on Wikipedia. With the rise of modern genetics, the concept of distinct human races in a biological sense has become obsolete. In 2019, the American Association of Biological Anthropologists stated, quote, the belief in races as natural aspects of human biology and the structures of inequality, racism, that emerge from such beliefs are among the most damaging elements in the human experience, both today and in the past. So it's taken from an article, uh, just reading from that, a quote, and that's, that's important to see that perspective, which makes more sense than a lot of these theories that they use to disprove the, the Book of Mormon, of course. I will put that link in the description. Leading authors on this subject cite some of the flaws of where the science of combining these fields has taken the scientific community. Too many regard the content of their genes as defining who they are. Television advertising, for example, features happy individuals who claim to have had their genetic ancestry determined. For example, quote, I thought I was German, but I am really Scottish. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, if, if anyone's relying on it to this point, you need to start asking questions. It's, it's not that simple. The in the medieval ages there was lots of conquest and various peoples came across uh, northern Asia into Europe there was a lot of intermixing there advertising is designed to sell a product as it sends the message that genes provide the facts about the essence of an individual and the groups to which one belongs now, this is from the OnlineLibrary.Wiley.com, much of modern biology, particularly the various controversies between different schools of thought, cannot be fully understood without a knowledge of the historical background of the problems. But surely there is a chance that merely demanding one set of beliefs be discarded based on a weak presentation 
of another set of religiously held beliefs might not might be sufficient to convince the rational thinker to discard their own knowledge for the sketchy musings of a random person or random viewer on this channel and that's a question asked in jest mayor has stated principal questions that must be addressed by anyone who wants to describe the progress of science critically and comprehensively who when where what how and why the problems with the comments of several viewers on this channel is that they have not satisfactorily made a case for any of these most people don't have the energy or desire to delve into the research on this level therefore most are not qualified to throw these theories around in their agenda to turn people against their faith and what do they offer to replace your faith with a dark hole they don't give you beliefs you you accept a clouded thinking viewpoint when you give up truth and that's simply because they use those complex sounding arguments assertively <laughs> and you find out they're just giving you religious beliefs that don't have the foundation or basis that the ones firmly grounded in the teachings of Joseph Smith do there are, there are hundreds of thousands of pages written to understand Joseph Smith and have emanated from that era anti-mormons typically believe there is a chance that merely demanding one set of beliefs be discarded is acceptable typically there is a complexity of mental gymnastics that they had not logically th thought through but they will they will always accept that you accept their religion on blind faith alone Joseph Smith explains the mission of the church again uh, we're talking about how this is one people um, this is the quote I've used it twice on purpose it is difficult to understand how any intelligent person could have ever doubted there was a wide exchange of ideas and goods among the ancient nations of America we are having theories emerge in this 21st century that are very demeaning and degrading to the ancient peoples that you were limited to one geographical area and you couldn't possibly have traveled from one continent to another even over centuries you couldn't have done that but Joseph Smith taught otherwise the question is are are you not defending Joseph Smith what are you defending if you're in this church if you're not defending Joseph Smith after he is dead if you were there when he was alive would you have defended him and how could you have if you don't even believe what he said Brigham Young's account regarding more information that verifies the teachings of Joseph Smith our departure shortly to the country of the Lamanites. He's calling the Rocky Mountain area the country of the Lamanites. They're rejoicing when they hear the gospel and the gathering of Israel. Again, we're still working on this mission of the church, this purpose of the church. Erastus Snow. So, again, talking about the Rocky Mountains. This is a plan from the early church days. Of Apostle Parley P. Pratt told the American Indians in 1851, you are a branch of the house of Israel. You are descended from the Jews, or rather more generally from the tribe of Joseph, which Joseph was a great prophet and ruler in Egypt. To, to conclude the last video, I had the uh, talk by Wilfred Woodruff. I'm going to read it again. I've got it posted here. I arrived in Kirtland, April 26, 1834, and there met Joseph and Hiram Smith in the street. I was introduced to Joseph Smith. It was the first time that I had ever seen him in my life. He invited me to spend the Sabbath with him, and I did so. They had a meeting on Sunday. On Sunday night, the prophet called on all who held the priesthood to gather into the little log schoolhouse they had there. 
It was a small house, perhaps 14 feet square, but it held the whole of the priesthood of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, who were then in the town of Kirtland, and who had gathered together to go off in Zion's camp. That was the first time I ever saw Oliver Cowdery or heard him speak, the first time I ever saw Brigham Young and Heber C. Kimball and the two Pratts, and Orson Hyde and many others. There were no apostles in the church then except Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery. When we got together, the prophet called upon the elders of Israel with him to bear testimony of this work. Those that I have named spoke, and a good many I have not named bore their testimonies. When they got through, the prophet said, Brethren, I have been very much edified and instructed in your testimonies here tonight, but I want to say to you before the Lord that you know no more that concerning the destinies of this church and kingdom than a babe upon its mother's lap. You don't comprehend it. I was rather surprised. He said, It's only a little handful of priesthood you see here tonight. But this church will fill North and South America. It will fill the world. Among other things, he said, it will fill the Rocky Mountains. There will be tens of thousands of Latter-day Saints who will be gathered in the Rocky Mountains. True. That came true. And there they will open the door for the establishing of the gospel among the Lamanites. Well, you can argue the uh, door has been opened. The, the Lamanites who will receive the gospel and their endowments and the blessings of God. Now that last part hasn't come true, and the question is, what was the effort really to make this third part come true? There could be a smattering of Lamanites who received their endowments. Did that satisfy this prophecy? I beg to differ. This, The other part, this people will go into the Rocky Mountains. There they will build temples to the Most High. Yes, they started building temples. They will raise up a posterity there, and the Latter-day Saints who dwell in these mountains will stand in the flesh until the coming of the Son of Man. Well, if you have not converted the house of Jacob, established the gospel among the Lamanites who will receive the gospel and their endowments and the blessings of God, if that hasn't taken place, it's not taking place, then how can you expect the end of this paragraph to happen if the, if the middle parts have not taken place? Latter-day Saints believe those who dwell in these mountains, they will stand in the flesh until the coming of the Son of Man, and he will come to them while in the Rocky Mountains. But if you have not fulfilled the mission, how could that, how could that ever happen? We're going to look at what Orson Pratt said again. I know I've used this one a few times. Mormon Apostle Orson Pratt stated, We, meaning the church, have forgotten the forlorn condition of the sons of Doza, the American Indians. We have forgotten the predictions of the holy prophets among their fathers, who so earnestly prayed to the Most High for themselves and their children to the latest generation whose prayers have been recorded in eternity and preserved in the archives of heaven to be answered upon the head of their posterity in the last days. We have forgotten these things and are dwelling at ease in Zion and neglecting the great redemption of Israel, referring to the Lamanites. If Orson Pratt was warning of this 150 years ago, and it was a stronger movement in the church back then than it is now, then what does that indicate for today? And again, let's, let's just go back to what Joseph Smith said and explains on the mission of this church. Verse 65 of Doctrine and Covenants 10, For behold, I will gather them, meaning the house of Jacob, the children of Jacob, as a Hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, if they will not harden their hearts. So we are still waiting for that to take place as prophesied in Scripture. 
there's still a lot of work to be done. There's no, no reason to be lackadaisical or at ease in Zion. Now Joseph Smith, if he had been allowed, he, his, his what he called his friends asked him to come back and submit to Nauvoo, um, the Carthage jail imprisonment, which he knew he would not survive. But he, uh, if the, if he had the ability, he would have come out west. And he said he only needed a hundred loyal men with him in the Rocky Mountains to help him accomplish that mission. Only a hundred, that Joseph Smith was that effective. The prophecy is tens of thousands will be centered in the Rocky Mountains, yes. But there is more to this prophecy that still needs to be fulfilled after two centuries. And the church with all its vast resources has failed in this original mission as it still has not taken all of the steps to fulfill the purpose articulated by Joseph Smith. Gather them, the house of Jacob, as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings. We need priesthood holders to bring themselves to repentance and, quote, turn their hearts back to their ancestors. And I know uh, we think of the baptism of the dead, but literally, turn your hearts back to your ancestors. Try to honor them. These are the people who sacrificed everything to help establish the restoration of the gospel. We need the literal as well as the spiritually sealed descendants of these great pioneers to gain a true understanding of these great men by following their examples, even emulating what they stood for. Again, I ask the question, if you are not, jo if you are not defending Joseph Smith after he is dead, how could you have defended him when you and he were alive in the same time. If you could go back and you could meet him, would you even recognize him? Would you understand anything he's saying or teaching? Because it doesn't seem to be the case in this, these modern times. Wilfred Woodruff, what did he really know about Joseph Smith? Joseph Smith was one of the most accomplished prophets in world history. There is one savior to the world, and that is Jesus Christ. This is a paraphrase. This is not a quote from a Wilford, Wilford Woodruff. But the church at that time believed in Joseph Smith's prophetic calling. And it was said of Joseph Smith when he was murdered that he was a, like a god to the saints in Nauvoo. But that did not mean the church ever got to worship Joseph Smith above Christ or to worship him even in mortal form. Joseph Smith was a man who had a very important mission in world history you you would be hard pressed to name a prophet that had more impact on Joel, on the world than Joseph Smith the last admonition of Joseph Smith June 23rd 1844 four days before he died again it's this emphasis he was true to this all through his all through his tenure as God's prophet this day the Lord has shown to me that which was never shown to me before that I have thousands of friends that never pretended friendship while others have sought to crawl into my bosom because of my good feelings toward them and now are the vipers and do seek my life and if they shall take it they will pursue you they will do it anyhow I therefore will say unto you saints and elders of Israel, you will yet be called upon to go forth and call upon the free men from Maine to gather themselves together to the Rocky Mountains and the red men from the west and all people from the north and from the south and from the east and go to the west to establish themselves in the strongholds of their gathering places and there you will gather the red men to their center. Why does he say to their sender? Does he say their limited geographic restrictions? Did he say travel to South America? Or did he say travel to that little place in Central America where some theorize the whole Book of Mormon took place? Did he say go back east of the Mississippi? No, he said the Redmen to their center. Well, of course he meant. He meant the whole continent and he meant both continents. 
gather them to their center from their scattered and dispersed situation. Okay, they're not locally confined to any area. They were scattered and dispersed over two continents. Gather them so that they may become the strong arm of Jehovah. Do you really know who Joseph Smith is? Wilford Woodruff said, do you know who Joseph... Well, I'm going to ask that question. I apologize. Uh, he's going to answer my question. Do you know who Joseph Smith is? Do you know what kind of person or being Joseph Smith was? Quote, Joseph was trained in the priesthood before he ever came to this planet. He understood the priesthood perfectly before he came here. He understood its work and its lineage so far as lineage applies to offices in the priesthood. He also understood that he was going away from this earth, but we did not know about it until after he was put to death from Leahona, the Elder's Journal, April 16, 1910. That was, that was quoting Wilfred Rudruff, of course, who did not live until that time, but that, so that's not the date of the quote, that's the date of the journal. The keys of the kingdom shall never be taken away from thee while thou art in the world or in the world to come. Nevertheless, the oracles may be given unto another, even unto the church. So here we have the uh, succession of uh, leaders. And you see the giant was Joseph Smith. And of course, uh, those who were loyal to him and knew him uh, were very significant in bring, helping to bring the church out west. Now, uh, some of the books I've been quoting, I'm, I just took a few pictures here. It's difficult to understand. This is the same quote. I know I've, I've mentioned it. But um, this is uh, from Columbus Came Late. So I'm going to go through a little bit faster on these pictures here. Of course, uh, I didn't uh, have access to this book long enough to take more pictures but you can see some of the ruins that are throughout both continents and they're definitely if you if you do the research and look at the the photos of those ruins on both continents you will say there was a certain similarity about all american civilizations all one people yes there was a certain similarity about all American civilizations from the Great Lakes to the mountains of Peru. There is a good reason to believe that goods destined for Mexico and North America from South Central America or South America passed river routes with short carries at the Sarstun Pasión route. So it is likely, however, that the trade was purely Maya. This is uh, from the book, though. And that this route served to connect the great cities of northern Yucatan with south southern Central America goods like Chichen Itza, Coba, and other cities in the interior doubtless reached the in east coast by such roads as one 50 feet wide and from 4 to 10 feet so these roads they have said if you uncover them and preserve them a little bit you could still drive on them today they were some of the most well built roads in world history not less however was a surprise of the first Spanish ecclesiastics who found out on reaching Mexico, a priesthood is regularly organized as that of the most civilized countries, clothed with a powerful and effective authority which extended its arms to man in every condition and in all stages of his life. The Mexican priests were mediators between man and the divinity. They brought the newly born infants into the religious society. They determined the entrance of the young men into the service of the state. They consecrated marriage. By their blessing, they comforted the sick and assisted the dying. 
And once again, uh, it has been sufficiently shown that this people are of the great Hebrew family. This is a book that has researched both continents. Widespread as they were, those sediments grew to be very populous. From Mr. Brackenridge, we learn that as many as 5,000 villages have been discovered in the valley of the Mississippi alone. And Mr. Caleb Atwater was of the opinion that the state of Ohio once possessed close upon a million inhabitants. His grounds for this assertion seems to have been the number and extent of the ruins, as well as the dimensions and content of the tumuli. Many of the mounds, he writes, contain eminent, immense numbers of skeletons. Those of Big Grave Creek are believed to be completely filled with human bones. The larger mounds all along the principal river of this state are also filled with skeletons. Millions of people have been buried in these cemeteries. Here's the text I read. He also expresses the opinion that the culture of the mound builders was introduced by a colony of, or by teachers from the south, namely by a colony of the ancient Maya. So we're going up to the Great Lakes, down to the Mayas. The Mayas who settled in the north during continuance of the great Maya empire of Zilbalb of Central America several centuries before the Mayas, the Incas, the Pueblos, mound builders were all one and the same people. From Dewey Farnsworth's book, The Americas Before Columbus, this is the book I'm taking these photos from, we are astonished to find the great congruity which exists between the religious beliefs of all tribes, even of the Mexicans and Peruvians. See, uh, there, the modern theories of Book of Mormon lands are completely off base according to the history we had just, just a generation ago or two generations ago. The principal Mayan highways throughout Yucatan were constructed with the base of large coarse rocks well tamped. Over this a second layer of smaller rocks was laid and again tamped on top of the second layer, a third layer of finely broken rock was laid, tamped, and leveled. The surface was finished with a lime cement called Sackby or White Earth. For this reason, the main highways are called Sackby. The, the width of these travel arteries varied from 9 to 30 feet, and the entire Mayan, Mayan area was likened by the first historians to a fine network of white roads from ancient Mayas, Stacy Judd, page 257. A singular evidence at once of the kinship and enterprise of the American races is the presence of the mounds of Ohio, of pearls and shells of the Gulf, and of the obsidian of Mexico, of the mica of North Carolina, of the jade of Chile, of the lead of Wisconsin, of the copper and proper probably the silver of Ontonagon and the Kinwina Peninsula, and of the carvings represented the Manti of South America or the Antilles. This is a, a quote here that pretty much encompasses the majority of two continents. And the point is it's a singular evidence of the kinship and enterprise of all the original American races. Just as Joseph Smith taught, this is a people in both continents where the church needs to take the gospel. You cannot write off an entire continent because uh, a vain theory of one person entered into the what we refer to as experts, but the more you look into their reasoning to start these bizarre theories of modern modern origins of the Book of Mormon, the more these things start to collapse. 
One fact is of great importance and proof of their great antiquity. And at that time, the ones they interviewed, they didn't have knowledge or tradition in the north of the life or crucifixion of Christ. Yet, they did have a knowledge of the deluge after actually practicing the laws of Moses. It enables us to at once place them in a chronological position according to this book. So, they're saying... Some of these places would be after Moses, but before the Savior. So there are certain time periods for each set of ruins. That brings their circle of time a little bit more narrow. But they are talking about 588 years before Christ, which coincides when the original people landed here as described in 1st Nephi in the Book of Mormon. There's a route along the coast from headland to headland, from Mexico to Peru, or from island to island across the benign Pacific. It must be taken as the principal factor in solving this so-called problem of connecting early cultures of America. This concludes this video. Please like the video and subscribe to this channel. Thank you for watching.